Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, we're going to begin this study, uh, continue our study on um, Judges chapter 8 and 9. So we're going to finish off chapter 8, even though we started on chapter 9. And, uh, and then uh, after that, we'll see where we go. But we have to review some things. So let's begin with the word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for our study each morning and for this new week of studies on the book of Judges and understanding the lines. We just invite your spirit's presence here. Help us to recognize the things in ourselves, uh, the shortcomings we have, our sins, the character defects. Help us to recognize these things and to confess our sins and to repent and to change um, the direction of our lives. Be with each person as we study your word together. And may your Holy Spirit be our teacher. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> um, so we're going to go back here to Judges chapter 8. And... We didn't have a lot of people here on Thursday, so it was a little bit difficult uh, from my perspective because there were some insights from others that I needed. Um, and I hope that people who weren't here on Thursday did watch the study. I know maybe not everybody had a chance to. But um, uh, hopefully there are some points that need to be brought up. Now, I went back and watched... Um, whatever date it was, November or something, uh, where we talked about Ziba and Zalmuna. And so it's interesting always to go back and see what we talked about, what kind of things we missed. Uh, there was uh, the name, name is Ziba and Zalmuna. If we put them into, uh, and let me see here. Were, um, Are we talking about the raven for one? Well, the raven, that's uh, um, Oreb and Zeb. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so Zeba and Zalmuna are going to be... Um, what was the number here? So, so if we... It, it was we talked about it on on this old video well old back in November um, there's why I have to spell the names correctly so uh, the two names together add up to 144 thousand so if you just take the normal sum of Ziba and Zalmuna you get 144. So Zeba by itself is 42, and Zalmuna is 102. <clears throat> and so we had mentioned that in this study. Um, but Zeba and Zalmuna, the idea that I had is, well, I said that they represent people, so, but people that are connected to a message. And um, so we have um, Sukkoth and Penuel, that these are representing, um, Sukkoth would represent the Canadian group and Penuel, the American group, so what we talked about. And Ziba and Zalmuna are messages um, that are being pursued by Gideon, but those that are connected with those messages, in a sense, Penuel and Sukkoth, they're not going to aid in the pursuing of Ziba and Zalmuna. So that's sort of the idea that we have. And these messages relate to um, the messages of Colin and Odilio, just like Orb and Zeb do. But we know that Orb and Zeb were pursued by uh, the men of Ephraim, right? So we have this story about the men of Ephraim 
and they're going to kill Orb and Zeb. And, and so these are people that we took the men of Ephraim as representing those who were called, but didn't realize they were called or, or were unhappy that they weren't called. But they are called again after July 18th. So after uh, that warning to Nashville fails. And um, they're, they're appeased by Gideon. But then they're going to, um, right away after that, we're going to see that Gideon's going to be pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna. So there, there's a relationship between Orb and Zeb and Zeba and Zalmunna. And, and so that's what we need to figure out and how we would put these on a line. Does that get people up to speed, so to speak? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. So, I mean, the first question is why, why is Zeba and Zalmuna, once again, why, why are these messages? What is it about these messages? Because this has to do with attitudes or opinions or approaches uh, to understanding truth. Because what we see in this movement, all through this history in the book of Judges, that we understand that these different messages are having this conflict, these conflicts. Um, that means there's something about there's different aspects to Collins and Odilio's messages. Maybe that's the best way to put it. Different, different ways in which they can be seen. Um, now, we know part of the, the issue here with, with Gideon has to do with the Midianites, which represents strife. And so these are dealing with the conflicts within the movement that are occurring and, and these changes of, of attitude that that need to occur on how we deal with each other. I mean, this is really clear from all the studies that we've had. Now, uh, I was talking before we uh, uh, started this study about uh, the Sabbath message. And so, um, and I want to comment on that a little bit. So, so, you know, first it was about music. And of course, I'm a musician, music teacher. And I've struggled with these issues of music um, my entire life, um, you know, but even, you know, especially, especially in my Christian life, but even before that. Um, so, you know, music obviously has a huge part in my life. I don't listen to music very often. Um, part of it is because it's my job. And I only listen to music pretty much when I have to there are situations where, where, you know, I do occasionally just listen to music for uh, other reasons that aren't, that aren't necessary, but it doesn't happen too often. Um, but it, what a lot of what uh, Mark Johnson said was, was correct. I mean, and, and some of it very obviously. So, I mean, we wouldn't want to listen to, uh, you know, satanic music or music that's overtly sexual or um, obscene, though there are, is music that is more subtly so that people may not recognize, especially when they're children, um, the references that are in music. And, and growing up, I always tried to avoid music that I thought had anything in it, you know, even before I'm like a converted Christian, just from my own personal value system that I didn't like things that were definitely satanic or overtly sexual or anything like that. Um, didn't have an understanding of music, what music is necessarily good or bad otherwise, but usually how it made me feel was also another factor. But those things can change because uh, the way that I liken it is that music is stimulating and, and in various different ways, different styles of music. And, and the idea that was presented that is, is correct is that uh, when we're exposed to uh, music that is overly stimulating, music that isn't 
stimulating becomes bland. And we could put a parallel there to food. If you're used to highly spiced food and somebody gives you food that has very little spices, you, it would be very bland and tasteless to, to people who are used to having highly spiced food. And the same thing would go for literature, uh, stories that people read. You then read the Bible. It doesn't, it doesn't seem as interesting. So, and that can happen in all different areas of life. But the thing that, um, that I want to talk about, and that I think we have to look at in the context of the book of Judges, has to do with the fact that what God is asking us to do is to look at ourselves. And so often, we spend our time talking about the evils of others, or even our past evils, which we no longer participate in and as sort of a way of justifying ourselves so we compare ourselves with others so we're not like other men are and so we can feel that that we're justified and so any type of message that we give even if it's something about the evils that are out there always should come back to the evils that are inside of us and, and our, our criticisms of others, even if our, our criticisms of others criticizing others, needs to come back to us. Right? We need to recognize why we say and do the things we say, even the things that are correct, um, because we need to see what's going on inside our own hearts at the present time. This is the only, only work that God really has given, well, not the only work, but it's the first work that God has given us to do. The only thing that we need to focus on right now is how we are um, not following God, that we're Laodicean. And, and so often we just focus upon other people that are the problem, but we are the problem. And so when we're looking at Judges 8 and we're looking at this movement, in, you know, it could seem when if I say Zeba and Zalmunna and, you know, that's Colin and Odilio's message. And then I say Sukkoth and Penuel, you know, that's the Canadian and American group. That somehow, you know, we, we could be setting ourselves apart from them as if they're the problem. But when it comes to, you know, because we could say, well, there's the American group and the Canadian group and then our, our wonderful group, right? But that's not how it is. Because in one way or another, we're part of this movement, whether we're part of the American group or the Canadian group. Uh, we're part of this movement, and, and the same thing is true of the Seventh-day Adventist church. We are Seventh-day Adventists. We are Laodicean. We can't distance ourselves from the church and then claim we're not Laodicean anymore, which is what people try to do. Is that clear what I'm, what I'm trying to say? Not yet completely clear. Okay. <clears throat> so we we could look at this situation and we can say, okay, with these messages uh, that um, that God has given to this movement, gave a message to Odilio, God gave a message to Odilio, and he gave a message to Colin. And we can look at this here and say, well, there's the message of Gideon. Now, that message of Gideon isn't, we are not the message of Gideon. This whole movement has been connected to the message of Gideon. That's the message of July 18th. And that message gives us light. So if we follow that light, then we are, are obeying that light, we're going to be reformed. Whatever this reform is that needs to happen, whatever this reform line is about, that we're coming from darkness 
God is giving us light and he's having us move towards something so that we can receive the next message. And, you know, the concern that I always have in my own life is when I see something is true and I start following it and I see, well, somebody else isn't following this that I believe to be true. The problem is, do I then see myself as better than them? Do I, you know, somehow, and this can happen not just in this movement, just in any way in life, we can look at a, at a person, we can see they're not following something that we're following, that we know to be true and they're not following it. But we have, we don't know all the truth and we haven't followed everything that God has asked us to do. And so we can't use that as a way of avoiding the reality of ourselves. So in all of these studies that we're doing, this is, is not meant to be an attack on others, but to meant to be an attack upon error, which exists within us. So, um, and I've been reading lots of things in this regard, like what uh, uh, Ron put up there. Remove from the heart that criticizing spirit. God hates it. Those who yield to this spirit have given themselves up to do Satan's work, and he stands by exalting. So Satan likes to see us criticize others. Now, I'm against criticizing others, but I have to be careful about my criticism of those criticizing others, right? Because it's easy to look at and say, well, I'm not critical, while I'm being just as critical as the people that I'm criticizing. So we need to be redemptive in our interactions with others, whether they're people out there in the world, whether they're people in the church, or whether they're people in this movement. How do you, how do you mean that? I mean, when you say redemptive towards others, what, what does that mean? Okay. Well, so Satan is the accuser of the brethren, right? Yes. The Holy Spirit, the comforter, convicts us of sin what's the difference so run that by me one more time the the satan's, two... satan's the accuser of the brethren right yeah so satan comes and accuses us and often justly i mean he's pointing out actual faults we have mm. the holy spirit Spirit, it convicts us of sin. What's the difference between the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of Satan? The way they well, do Satan is accusing you. The Holy Spirit is trying to um, change your heart. Okay, right. In so, your mind. so that means in our interactions with others, pointing out their faults is not enough because that's not really what the Holy Spirit's doing. The Holy Spirit, how does it bring conviction? Um, God's by word, the knowledge of the not word. living up to the standard of yeah, to the standards of His word, and then okay. He leads us to Christ. You know, your forgiveness is in Him. Right. So we are then shown Christ through the Holy Spirit. Christ is revealed. Right. So so I need to have the character of Christ in order to be redemptive in dealing with others. Because it's easy to point out the faults of others. Anybody can do that. You know, anybody can, you know, find a fault with a brother and and point it out. And uh, somebody's mic's on. I'm gonna turn your mic off. Thanks. Um, it was mine. To, yeah, can find a fault with another person. But we need to do something that's redemptive. That is, we need to help that person. We need to lift them up. We need to, to show them that they are loved and cared for. That just because we see a fault in them, I mean, we may not even directly point out that fault. Sometimes it just comes by the way that we live our lives and how we interact with things happening around us. Right. So 
so it's easy to to rag on people to use a sort of common common parlance about different things whether it's diet or you know the health message or what we listen to and all those types of things all the things that are sort of obvious that every one of us knows that if we we talk about those things we're going to be stepping on people's toes and it doesn't mean that it's wrong to to talk about these things but we need to lift them up we need to give them hope we need to focus upon how god can help us in overcoming let's say it's an addiction to to music or entertainment or something like that because often what ends up happening is a person just feels bad about themselves and and that's not what the holy spirit does the holy spirit convicts of sin of righteousness and judgment so there's a progress, progressive work that, that we need to do um, in ministering to others. And so every, yeah, so uh, we have another quote there from Ron. In order to lead souls to Jesus, there must be a knowledge of human nature and a study of the human mind. Much careful thought and fervent prayer are required to know how to approach men and women upon the great subject of truth. And of course, especially in... Um, helping people when they're they're in a struggle with sin because people all of us struggle with sin and so that's from uh, councils to the church of 68.3 so so when i think about this here in in judges what we've been doing um we can see there's obviously truth and error and and we've been seeking in this movement and in these studies to come to the upper room. That is, we know that we have done things that have hurt other people. Well, some of those people have sort of cut themselves off from us. And it'd be easy just to say, well, I've done my, done my part. I've apologized, you know, for the things that I've done that I've hurt people that I know about. And, you know, they don't really seem that interested in, in what we have to say. So maybe we should just brush the dust off our feet and go on our way. There's, there's a natural tendency to want to do that. Um, but in some ways we would then be no better than the people that we condemn. That we abandon. Amen. Right. So, so what we, what we are doing in these studies, what I believe God is showing us, is he's showing us a way that we personally can change. But also how we can minister to those who are caught up in these, these errors or ways of thinking. Because where in those, we have errors in thinking. And, and so somehow God is going to have to correct us if he's going to use us to correct anyone else. Now, so, um, you know, Stephen put up some, some charts uh, this morning, which I'm not, not gonna, we're not going to look at right now. We might look at them at another time. But, you know, we have all of these witnesses that our chronology is correct. And God keeps giving us these witnesses. Now, why do you think that is? Why, why does he continually have Stephen and Dilio? Dilio noticed some things here too. Um, and myself and Dwight and, and others. Uh, Odilio and Aran. So we got all of these people. Stephen, Odilio, Aran, Dwight, myself and, and others, right? Finding things, sharing scriptures, you know, even, uh, you know, William noticed uh, something, you know, that he shared and, and that triggered something with the white. So why is God showing us all of this light? What, what's the reason? To show us that we need each other and that unity is possible. Okay. So, so he's showing us that we need each other. That, that the light doesn't come from one source. Now we could say, well, you know, the light is coming from, 
you know, the stuff that we're interested in is coming from a certain source or whatever. It's coming you know, from this study group. But we, you know, Colin is finding out things that I think are, uh, that we have to look at, right? So we got all of this, this light. So we need each other. And we're having witnesses that, that the chronology that we have is correct. So that in, in that sense, unity is possible. Okay. And, and then we become united on, on what principle? What's the principle that unity comes about, that brings unity about? Truth is truth at the end of the day. doesn't matter where it comes from. Okay. Anybody else with what, what, what's the, the principle that unity is based upon? Love for God and mankind. Okay, so unity is based upon unity with Christ, which comes how? Well, through him. I mean, we can't work it up. That's for sure. <laughs> no. So, no. I mean, we have to focus on the truth. It doesn't matter who it's, who it's coming from, you know. And this is a fellow creature. This is somebody who is weak and frail like I am, that's flawed like I am, but is trying to, you know, have a, that link with Christ. And that's what we should be looking at. Yeah, so, so we have to obey Christ. We have to be united with Christ by cooperating with him in the work that he's doing in ourselves and the work that he's doing in this world. And um, so when we look at what's happening in this history in Judges, we see that, you know, here is a work that was given by God to Gideon, right? And yet in doing this work, he's not being supported. Right? By the men of Sukkoth and the men of Penuel. But he's pursuing the truth. That is, he's trying to understand these messages, right? Because that's how we're looking at this pursuing in, in the context of these symbols. This is sacrifice and uh, sh the shelter is withheld. That's Zeban Zalmuna. Um, So how how are we going to sort this out then? I mean, not not just these verses, but how are we going to sort out what it is we are to do? What is this telling us that we are to do to bring about this unity? So because we have the Canadian and the American group, and we have our group, let's say our group is somehow connected to, to pursuing Ziba and Zelmuna, because that's how we understand it. And this is, of course, after July 18th. You know, this, this group isn't, isn't this particular group that our study group here, yeah. as opposed to the Canadian study group and the, and the uh, American study group. Yeah. Well, American study group is American, Canadian is Canadian, and this particular group is a mixture of both. I understand, but but, but and we, even more. We're, yeah, we're pursuing something, right? That's right. Which which is what you know. First, we examined the foundation, and now we're seeking to understand the lines. And and we believe that this is how we're going to bring about unity. But it's not just because we get to know the truth intellectually and we have, you know, that, you know, let's say we, we have this camp meeting in the summer, which we're planning on. And, uh, you know, we get together some nice notes um, explaining all the things that we've learned. They're really nice and organized, very clear, simple, easy to understand. Um, but that's not enough. Right, that isn't going to bring about unity, especially if you know nobody comes. But even then, and even if they came, we need there has to be something more than just an intellectual understanding of truth. Right. So God is trying to do a work on us right now. 
And so if we look at, at this story, it's not the story of the good guys and the bad guys. Right? It's a story about these messages over time because these messages are all um, way marks, right? First, second, and third angels' messages as they develop over time. People end up accepting messages or rejecting messages. So is that more clear, Dwight? Or is it? No, it's very. Th this is this is e even more clear because first <clears throat> we're looking at this as the the need for the, the that the message in the whole faces because if the if the whole message if if all of us together mm -hmm. are willing to address this first individually and then as a group how will we ever come to that upper room experience mm -hmm. the the rest of this is also showing that there is going to be a need in this type of unity that we're going to have to accept that our Heavenly Father is allowing the wheat and the tares to continue to grow together, that there will become a time that he is going to begin the harvesting process where he will separate the wheat and the tares. Yeah. Now, um, you know, bringing up the wheat and the tares, if you remember, uh, this would be 2000, um, 2017. That okay. Arminder was pushing this view on the wheat and tares. I don't know if it was 2017 or 2000. Pretty sure it was 2007. It was, a, it was about that time, yes. Yeah. And, and um, you know, one thing there is always this assumption. Well, I'm the wheat. Right? The others are the tares. And, and they were pushing this idea. One is... Um, it had to do with the church triumphant uh, that was being pushed early in the spring of 2017. Um, you know, the church, the, this movement does not sin, right? There was a bunch of ideas being thrown around um, that really, um, I mean, they were truth, truth mixed with error. But the real big problem was, you know, God's just going to get rid of, of the tares and, and we'll be left, right? But when you look at the wheat and tares, there is an application that, you know, one is we know it, it deals with people who aren't interested in truth and those that are. But also, even in the individual life, an application can be made that the wheat and tares grow together until the harvest, that is, in the time of the harvest, things in our characters, in our lives, are removed. Who is just what the ones that do the harvesting though? Well, that's the problem is we have these, these, it depends on what application you're making. We're, uh, we're, I always thought it was the, the angels. Harvest. Yeah. The angels do the harvesting. Yeah. And, and, and what do we consider the angels to be? Well, messages. Hello. Yeah. So we have to be able to heed these messages and, and, so it's not as clear cut is that, you know, there's these good people, us, who are the wheat and the bad people, whoever they are, the others are the tares. Uh, I always considered myself as being a tear. Well, I don't know if that's necessarily the right approach either. I, I know, but that's that's <laughs> why I, I do that, though. I mean, I, I, I try to think of myself as, which I, I, I can prove out real well and real easy, um, what I am. Uh, but I like to think that God has got his hands reached out to me that I can do better if I, if I just try. Well, yeah, but that's, that wouldn't be the correct understanding either. It's a cooperation with God. And um, he, there's things in our characters that have to change. 
and some very basic things in our characters that have to change. That you well, know, I can we, never ascribe yeah. any change that I do to myself. <laughs> yeah, but you but you understand right? things that have to change, and God is giving us a message to bring that conviction and that power, so that we can cooperate with Him, and and so that's the context in which we need to understand these messages. Because these messages are about this movement. We are members of this movement, but we are not, um, you know, we can't just say, well, I'm, I'm Gideon, you know, I'm, I'm that part. And I'm not this or I'm not that. In a sense, this is describing all of us. It's just like Laodicean. You know, when God talks about the Laodicean church, he's talking about us. And the question is, is he telling us? speaking truthfully or not if if we believe god then we are wretched miserable poor blind and make it naked and we know it not right amen right so if you say well i'm obviously not wretched mis miserable poor blind and naked um then you would just be uh testifying to what god says because you just are wretched miserable poor blind and naked but don't know it Right. So the thing that we have to do is admit that God is correct about us. Amen. And, and we have to see this also in these messages, that these messages are representing what has been happening in this movement. Um, and these are the messages. So the pursuing of Ziba and Zalmunha. Is, is a pursuit of messages, which we say, well, these are Midianites, right? These are Midianite kings. How can they represent something good? Well, they're not necessarily representing something good. There's something that needs to be conquered in the understanding of these messages, right? Because these are connected to Messages that are a mixture of truth and error. With Theodore, you know that um, you know the story where the the uh, men from the east came to Jesus when he was born. And yeah. Gave him that. Yes, that story yeah. where they they were they were Israel. I mean, it's my rights, right? Yeah. So. They were coming to give a message. They were coming to give gifts, right? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that correlate with the um, zebra and and that um, the, which one was the other ones? Zebra, zebra, zebra. Yeah, you know what I'm saying, anyway, though. Yeah, I, well, I know what you're saying. So, I mean, we know that they're under the Midianite impression, the children of the East, and. Um, uh, the the Amalekites is it um, are the ones oppressing them, and um, then we see that uh, there's a prophecy, right? So we've gone through this the chapter six and seven. I mean, there's a prophet who had given a message that they'd be delivered, but we know that the reason that they're being oppressed is because. They're not following God. They're worshiping idols, right? Correct. Right. So, so these people are then given a message. This is light that's given to them. And, and so this oppression is also from God. But they, but they need to overcome this oppression and that oppression is this conflict that exists in this story of Gideon right and we see all, all of these conflicts we see the conflicts that Gideon has with um you know his own people with the the children of uh uh you know he's from the tribe of Manasseh right and in uh let me see here what's the the word I'm looking for right so um, when he's yeah, they wanted to kill him for destroying the tent, their worshiping place on his daddy's property. Right. So um, 
yeah, so this this land, you know, he's in Oprah. And um, and there's the other place. What is it? The, well, you have this threshing floor. Um, yeah, the altar of Baal, which is in what's the place that we would call this? Can't think of it. Anyway, it's somewhere in here. And, you know, and then they're going to fight against uh, the Midianites, this host of the Midianites. And so they're overcoming something that is light has come to them to, to get rid of the idols. Um, there's going to be a struggle and a conflict. But that conflict is internal. It's not an us and them conflict, even though in this story, it looks like it's an us and them conflict. But if we think about this as, as things that come from God to correct us, our overcoming those things has to do with things in our character that have to be overcome. So when Gideon... Um, defeats Zeba and Zalmunna, and he doesn't get the support. You know, we're, we're saying that, well, this is the lack of support within the movement. Succoth represents the Canadian group. Penuel represents the American group. But it's not really these groups. It's really attitudes that exist within all of us. And, and Zeb and Zalmunna have to be messages that need to be understood or things that need to be overcome in understanding oh, the life of the demons, right? So there's attitudes that we have to overcome no matter who we are. It's not an attitude that somebody else has to overcome. It's an attitude that I have to overcome. And so God has given us all of this light, all of this chronology, all of this way of looking at the book of Judges, that we can see our history and we can see the mistakes that we have made. And we can see how those that have chosen not to be corrected as a warning to us. So when we look, for instance, at the December 6, 2020 declaration, we've seen it here in these lines in the book of Judges. The one thing we know is that those people who wrote that declaration, they had passed an earlier test. That is, they had rejected the message of Parminder. And yet, in the end, they were no different. And that should be a warning to us. Because the question is, are we any different than the people we criticize? No. No. As Dwight always says, you got three fingers pointing back at yourself when you're pointing at someone else. The very fact that we tend to criticize um, things that are particularly something within ourselves. What's the principle? Why do we? Why do we focus upon? the things that we ourselves are not willing to address in ourselves. Why did he that judgeth another man does the same things? Why is that? Well, so he doesn't think about those things that he's doing wrong. Yeah, it's, it's a way of self-justification. You know, if I can, and, and you'll see this, in, in other examples where you'll see somebody, and I'll just use this example, that the people that I knew that protested the most against homosexuals when I were young turned out to be homosexuals. I, I understand exactly what you're saying. Okay, so I, I don't really like using that example, but that's one I can think that's really obvious. Um, so. 
so that tends to be you know when somebody it's a diversion very, tactic about, is what it is what's that it's a diversion tactic yeah well and meant to divert ourselves often that's right right so when you see somebody who's who's highly critical of certain types of things um you can be certain that that probably that person is struggling in that area and that's not a reason to condemn them right because that person's struggling in that area and and so you know we have to figure out how can we be redemptive so the question was you know how can we be redemptive well one is to uh, to come close to people to show acceptance and love not censure No, I came that, to save the lost. Isn't that what he said? Right. So, I mean, there are times, you know, when people are doing something that's immediately dangerous, but so often, you know, those sins that exist in another person that we're so critical of, that we're so ready to condemn them for and to have others condemn them and censure them, you know, exist within ourselves for one, but also that's not going to actually redeem the person. So you have to do a personal labor for someone. And that personal labor requires that you, you have to die to self. You have to somehow reach that person. Because, yes, sure, you see those things in that person. And you can say, well, I've overcome them or I've struggled with them. Um, but if you just start condemning them, if you start shunning them, if you shut them out, you're shutting them out from an opportunity uh, so you need to identify with that, that person in some way that that person can see, you know, that, that you understand to some degree, not that you condone whatever it is. Um, but you also have to show them a better way. And, and so you have to have a Christ-like character. You know, you definitely can't um, redeem them. So the things that are God's responsibility the Holy Spirit's responsibility. You leave to the Holy Spirit. You can't convict the heart, but you can live a life of love and acceptance and compassion to those that are in error. And, and that person can then be drawn to Christ. And, and it doesn't, you know, I mean, there are different types of error, right? There's doctrinal error. So some people just think, things that are wrong and then there is error that is you know sins that um are very damaging and dangerous that would be on the other side of it you know you're not going to be uh, particularly compassionate with uh, somebody who's um murdering babies right as an extreme example and uh you know try to sympathize with them i mean obviously there's things that are just extreme but when a person is struggling with the character defect, let's say the person is a gossip, or let's say they're critical of others, and, and they're insecure in themselves, they know that they're doing wrong, but they don't want to face it. Um, and, and we then just find faults with them and start pointing it out. And, um, you know, we, we find them annoying or whatever it is, you know. Um, we have to figure out a way to help people. And this is the most difficult part about being a Christian. Is how do we do the Lord's work? How do we minister to other people? Sometimes it's listening. Sometimes it's being a friend. Sometimes it's standing up for truth. It's, it's, and it's not... I mean, that's why we have to be so careful about our conduct, because people are watching us all the time. You know, we, you know, if you have social media, you have to be careful about the things you post. Um, you have to be careful in your language, in the people that, how you talk about things, how you talk to other people. All these things are really important because people are watching. People are observing what you do. They're seeing if you're consistent or not. And, you know, we've all failed in this. I know I've failed in this. You know, and sometimes, you know, it's difficult because I've failed, you know, to know where to pick up again. 
you know, in some ways I can see that my, you know, not being there in the, in the studies for basically a year, you know, I can see in some ways that was my own, um, you know, avoidance, uh, uh, instinct or something, things that are uncomfortable, things that are difficult to deal with. I also see God's providence in it as well, but you know, this is where we are at in this movement right now, right? We're in a movement that's, that's, that has problems. We're like a dysfunctional family. And uh, there's not a lot of communication happening. There's a lot of avoidance on, on all sides. And yet somehow uh, we need to we need to go to the upper room, whatever that means. I don't know particularly how that happens. But, you know, that so so as we're approaching this, as we're approaching putting this on a line, um, you know, I don't, what, what I talked about in one of the studies earlier is I just don't know how we can proceed. That is, if you go to the lines that we have, so I'll go there, right, to finish off. Um, so we're taking that the whole line of Gideon is represented by Jeroboam and Gideon, these two different names. Um, one's internal, one's external. The Jeroboam is internal, uh, and Gideon is external, more focused upon what's happening with the church and what's happening with the July 18th prediction as far as... Um, external events um though both of them have in, internal and external events i mean you got the december 5th 25th 2020 which is the bombing of nashville so um so you know it's maybe not as clearly defined as that but um you know we wanted to put this story of gideon on these lines and, and we sort of have them we could say that you know, chapter six is the first angel's message. Chapter seven is the second. And then chapter eight is the third angel's message and the Sunday law, right? And, and it's a focus upon the December 25th, 2022 date. Chapter seven is a focus upon the July 18 date. And uh, chapter six is a fo focus upon the 9-11-2019 date, right? So that's how we... We looked yeah, at those that was, was determined. Yeah. But as far as, you know, putting which verses are where, because we have sort of these two different lines, um, they sort of overlap. And there are some verses that we couldn't really put in there in the way that we would have wanted to, like chapter eight, uh, verse six. So, you know, we didn't really have a way of, uh, of putting that in there particularly. And then, uh, and we can see that too on uh, these lines here. So we did kind of put it in here as the December 25th, 2021 date when we put it here in these lines. So, so, so I said, well, we're going to leave judges. We're going to leave, not judges, but Gideon. So judges six to eight, sort of set them aside. And then we would go to judges chapter nine. And with judges chapter nine, we have, um, uh, Jotham, right? So, so Jotham is Samuel Snow's message, right? That's how we looked at it. And, and we call it, um, J the Jotham line is the 18720. Does anybody remember why I put 18720 there under Jotham? So and nobody remembers, I mean, some people may not have watched the video. No, um, I don't have the 18720 log. I got 187200, which was the product of 120 times a time or, or 360. 
Yeah. Okay. And I got the days between February 663 and May 9th, 1914. That's another 187200. Yeah. Now, now, you asked about an event on February 6, 1963. You wanted yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. I have the date, but I don't have the. Well, I was born. I was born. That was your birthday? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. That's why I got that. Never mind. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. I've been scratching my head on that one for about a week now. Okay. So, so when we go to, um, yeah, so we dealt with this Jotham. It had to do with um, this Mayan calendar symbol, right? Now, right. So, so we spent some time looking at that. This was on, on Thursday. Um, so this had to do with my birthday and my 52nd birthday is December or not December, February 6, 2015, right? So if we count from the start of the mind calendar, December 21, 2012, um, that's going to be 1,872,000 yeah. right? And then if we count from my birthday, um, we, we come to, because I wanted to look at that number, uh, well, what I was actually looking at, 777 days from the start of the month, from that Mayan calendar um, in 2012. So when you get that 13th back tune, right? Right. Then, you know, that's my birthday. That's that 13, 3113 Gregorian though, right? Um. Yeah, if you're ta talking, that's where we. Go, that's why I remember the thirteen, thirteen. Right, thirty-one. They were back to back. Yeah, so you go to that Gregorian, and so then, yeah, so that's thirty-one, thirteen BC. That's going to be uh, August eleventh. August eleventh. That's right. Right, on on the Gregorian calendar. Right, and yeah, so if you go from that August eleventh, thirty-one, thirteen, it brings you to one million eight hundred and seventy thousand. 72,000 days to that December 21st, 2012 date. Right. And 777 days from there is my 52nd birthday. And 52 times 360 is 18720, right? So the, the, the point about that is that this Mayan date becomes part of these lines that is, um, we'll say, a parallel to Samuel Snow's understanding. That is, we also have the Lamex, because remember, Samuel Snow was dealing with the 70 weeks and particularly the 70th week, the midst of the week. That's gonna be sort of the basis for Samuel Snow. Um, the main difference between him and Miller, because Miller's gonna have Christ crucified at the end of the 70th week. Right, 490 years to the day from when Ezra leaves the river Ahava, right? But that's incorrect, right? So it, it relates to the 70th week. So that's why we have the 18720 there. It, it relates to the Lamex, it relates to the seven, seven times. Um, and so I'm having there that there is a symbol, right? And it's a symbol of the July 18, 2020 prediction. So the message of Jotham is the message specifically that relates to the light that I had in regard to July 18th. But it also is this movement, right? So remember, this movement is involved in this July 18, 2020 prediction, right? So we saw this in these other lines. Yes. Yeah. So this, even though I came up with July 18, 2020, um, from the study of Ezekiel and Revelation 9, et cetera, um, it's this movement taking up that date that matters. Right? If the movement doesn't take up the date, it doesn't matter what I found. That's right. Okay. And I understood that 
when when I found the date and and then it was rejected. So it, it didn't matter to me that I thought the date was significant because even if it could have been, it wouldn't have been if the movement hadn't taken it up. Does that make sense to people? Yes. Yeah. Well, since it was taken up, I mean, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen ways that we have uh, looked at one eight seven. Okay. Yeah, and probably more than that. But... Uh, there's probably more, but I just have those. Yeah. So, and and so we need to understand this principle that's here. The the principle is that. As we pass over fulfilled prophecy, light is going to reflect on, pa on past events, and they're going to shine light forward to our path. And, and so none of us creates these things. This is all about a movement passing through time. It's all about noticing these things. <laughs> Not that we've done it, but it's just noticing it. Right. So, so we have these symbols from the past you know, by looking at these prophecies in the past. But, you know, if the movement hadn't taken up July 18th, if it hadn't taken up November 9th, if it hadn't taken, you know, the 777 structure, these wouldn't have actually meant anything, right? You, you understand what I'm saying? Well, yeah, then they don't to some. <laughs> right, but, but they only mean something because we've passed through that history. Right. So, so we can look at this Jotham line as a message, Right. And it's going to be this parable, and this parable of Jotham has these uh, characteristics in it, right? So you're going to have Abimelech's conspiracy. You're going to have the 77. Um, but no, the, the 70, pardon me, the 70 sons, right? And then you're going to have the 70th son survive, Jotham. But they're always going to refer to the 70 that were killed, even though 70 aren't killed, only 69 are. Right. Some people think, well, maybe they're 71, but, but this is actually a common way they do things in Hebrew. And we do the same thing in English, too, but right. it's more common in Hebrew. Um, um, and then he's going to give this parable. Now, so this parable. Uh, when we talked about it, we know that it's it's a three one combination, right? You have three trees that bear fruit and one that doesn't. The bramble, so the bramble doesn't bear fruit. Um, now I put the bramble there as the third, just on on this chart on the, that you see in front of you. And, and so this is what we're supposed to start to look at this week. Maybe we could get this done this week. Okay. So, I mean, I don't know how that would really fit in, but that's what I put there on Thursday. I put Bramble at the arrival of the third angel. Okay, so let's let's go to the text. We're going to read this again. Um, now remember, this is on Mount Gerizim. He gets up on Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing. And the men of Shechem are in the valley below, right? Um, they had made Abimelech king uh, by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. So we know where this is. This is where the Mount of Blessings happened. And now they're here again. Abimelech's being made king. And Jotham is up on the top of Mount Gerizim. And he's calling down to the men below with this parable. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honor God and man and go to be promoted over the trees? And the tree said to the fig tree, come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit 
and go to be promoted over the trees? Then the trees said unto the vine, Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go, go to be promoted over the trees? Then said the trees unto the bramble, Come thou and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, If in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now, therefore, if ye have done truly and sincerely in that ye have made Abimelech king, and if ye have dealt well with Jeroboam and his house, and have done unto him according to the deserving of his hands, for my father fought for you and ventured his life far and delivered you out of the hand of Midian. And ye are risen up against my father's house this day and have slain his sons, three score and ten persons upon one stone, and have made Abimelech, the son of his maid servant, king over the men of Shechem, because he is your brother. If you have truly dealt truly, if you have dealt truly and sincerely with Jael Baal and his house this day, then rejoice ye in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Milo, and let fire come out from the men of Shechem and from the house of Milo and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran away and fled and went to Beer and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech his brother. So this parable. Uh, when we looked at this originally, um, there was different ways that we could look at this. So what, what if we're taking the trees to be the, um, the trees are God's people. These are the cedars of Lebanon, right? And they're seeking to have these other things to reign over them what are these other things these other trees representing the olive the fig and the vine what uh the true word of god and the bramble isn't i i, I don't I don't. Okay. So yeah, I understand your question. So, so we don't know particularly uh, at this point, you know, what, what is meant. So we're just looking at some options. So we're going to say that, well, these represent um, different aspects of truth, right? In, or different ways of understanding truth or representing truth. That sounds fair. Yeah. Now, the fig tree, of course, can represent uh, the church, God's people, right, as well. So why would, but so do the cedars of Lebanon, but they want the fig tree to reign over them. But the fig tree won't because it would have to forsake its sweetness. So what does that mean? So when the trees want them to reign over them, um, what does that mean? How do we understand that symbol? Be like they want a king over. Okay. Um, just trying to find this verse that's there. Second Kings 14.9 is what I'm supposed to be looking at. Uh, and Jehoash, the king of Israel, sent to Amaziah, king of Judah, saying, the thistle that was in Lebanon, sent to the cedar that was in Lebanon, saying, give thy daughter to my son to wife. And there passed by a wild beast that was in Lebanon and drove down the thistle. All right. So here we see another parable using trees, thistle in this case, and um, the cedar. So if we look at these symbols of these trees, Why are they using these symbols? Why is Jotham using these symbols? So we've got the olive tree, the fig tree, the vine, and the bramble. Mm, okay, so olive trees produce oil. Which represents the Holy Spirit. Uh, figs are a fruit that's sweet. 
Yeah, and it's used by Christ to represent the church. And it, okay. And then what was the other one? Well, the vine. The vine. Doctrine. And there's the there's the uh, uh, the wine, the doctrine, the. Yeah. Um, that's the only thing I can I can think of. I mean, in, in that respect, it, it, to, you know, as a symbol for us. Okay. Any other thoughts? Because we see the three one. Yeah, figs can be laid on wounds to heal them, like boils too. Yeah, he can. So it's it's healthy as well. Well, yeah. So how would we how would we address these? Are these? What is he saying in this parable? In the end, we have the brambles going to reign over them. I mean, are there different times that the the people of God had wanted? Because these represent things in the past. Yeah, that's that's Potential. what I'm thinking. I'm just trying to think. Of who are they referring to? What are mm -hmm. they referring to? Yeah, well, that's what. I'm, so first off, we would need to understand it in that context. Would it be like Jesus when he was he was giving his parables and lessons that <clears throat> he used it to instead of giving them the um, whole message he gave them you know bits and pieces of it so they wouldn't he gave them the whole message but they did uh, how was I going to put that never mind <laughs> well I know what you're saying but. I mean, here he's he's using a parable not to to hide because, I mean, obviously they would be seeking to kill him anyway. So so he's using this for a reason. This parable to illustrate it. Um, but yeah, do they represent pa past history? That's what it would seem. So I mean. Can we look back at the, the that history, you know, um, from it would be when sometime from the time that Israel became Israel till. OK, well, it, it could refer to, um, you know. Because we, we grouped our judges, you know, Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, Deborah and Brack, and then Gideon, right? Those are the first three judges, so to speak, even though Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar are really three different judges. But we group them together. They represent that period. Um, Deborah and Barak then represent the formalization of the message, and then Gideon, the empowerment of the first message. Okay. Okay. Um, in the story of Jotham, I mean, we have Jotham, but we also have Abimelech. So it's Abimelech, Jotham, you know, together. Mm -hmm. um, but Abimelech here, in this case, he's technically the judge. Jotham isn't. But we don't put Abimelech on our line of the judges. We just put the name Jotham there. Because in its, a sense, it, it's an extension of Gideon um, to some degree. But it, it's a prophecy as well. Right. So it's the prediction before midnight. So there was three, three portions. There was the uh, the vine, the uh, the olive fig, the olive, the olive first. So if you take Othniel as being the olive, because he represents the Holy Spirit. Um. So in that period of the judges, I mean, maybe that's what's being represented. That period of time. Hmm. That because people want somebody to reign over them, right? Instead of God. Right? Deborah and Barak. Um, 
that would be the fig tree if we're going to follow through with that, that analogy. And then Gideon would be the vine. And then in the time of Jotham, we have Abimelech and he would be the bramble, right? So that would be an option. Would it also be the, the first, second, and third angel's message? Yeah, but followed by Abimelech? How would that be the fourth? Okay, so the, the point of Jotham is he parallels Samuel Snow, right? That is, he's taking the messages from the beginning. And we can also see that there is... Um, let's say, an inheritance that the message has. So if people want uh, Jeff to reign over them, let's put it that way, in the movement. Was that a question? No, yeah. did. did people want Jeff to reign? Well, yeah, I would have to say yes. Okay, so what do you what how would you describe that? What what would be your example of that? Um well I guess I couldn't I can't really produce a, an example, not actually being there in the beginning and never really having any communication with them, just just watching the videos. Um the amount of interest. And the uh, the support that, that he had. Um, would, it, would it be that those ones who wanted to follow him but didn't want to study? Say that again. <clears throat> the ones that wanted to follow Jeff and make him king are the ones that didn't want to study. Somewhat. They, just, they wanted to. They wanted to just follow. Uh, Jeff. I, I don't have any personal experience with. The, the people that were involved. Um, but I can see that happening. Well, well, it definitely did happen. That is, many people in the movement did not really understand what Jeff was saying. And, and it was a lot of video watching or going to meetings, but not a lot of personal study. Mm. Right? So, and we saw that the people... We're generally just following Jeff when, especially when the separation started to happen. Um, it was really more, who are you following? Now, if we're going to try to parallel it in our history, I mean, we can see that, and, and, and Jeff wasn't asking people to follow him, right? But people were trying to make him basically like a prophet, Yes, okay. which seems logical. Right. So it's like, here's somebody who knows a lot about the Bible. He's opposed to the church, like we are, right? Um, you know, so he's controversial. And for some people, that's just enough, right? They want somebody to follow, just in a general sense. I mean, I've seen this my whole life as an advocate. That people like following speakers. Um and, and but don't necessarily understand all of the issues themselves. You know, so so for me, you know, because I'm a studier, right? And and I'm not very satisfied with just not understanding something. Mm. But many people were. So an example for me was when I I said that I didn't understand the lines. This was in, in 2016 at the camp meeting in the fall of 2016. And, you know, I said, I didn't understand the lines to some of the people from Alabama and they were quite shocked that I would one is admit it, <laughs> but, but mostly, I mean, it was almost like saying the emperor has no clothes because, you know, it was um, because I didn't understand the lines and, and you shouldn't really say that you had to sort of make like you understood it, but they didn't understand the lines either. Right. So it's not like I said, well, I don't understand the lines. And they said, well, here, I'll explain it to you. Here's how we understand the lines. And this should be simple. 
they were just like, whoa, you don't understand the lines. And then they brought that back later. Well, you said you didn't understand the lines. You know, well, I said, yeah, I didn't because they don't make any sense. Um, but they had already rejected the lines by that time. So, so if they had understood them, they wouldn't have rejected them. But when they rejected him, it was clear that they had never understood them. And yet, even though I said I didn't understand the lines, I didn't understand what was being said. But I did understand the lines, you know, to a much greater degree than they did, because I understood the, the purpose of them. And I maybe didn't understand all the details and sorted them all out. But, you know, the point is, they just wanted somebody. And, and they followed Jeff, and then they followed Mark Bruce, right? But are they still following Mark Bruce? No, right? People just keep following people. And, and this is part of human nature, because why do we follow other people? What, what, what's the motive? Well, uh, they know where they're going. Well, and it shirks individual responsibility. Yes, right. That's yeah. That's the uh, pr that's the takeaway. Yeah, I can give you an example of that. Yeah. Okay. When 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 I moved up here in Hickory, I started driving this this quad tandem, right? And I didn't know no, I didn't know these roads up here for nothing. I mean, I couldn't tell you which way to go or, where, or how to get there. Mm -hmm. But I had to end up, uh, what I had to end up doing, I I started following other truckers who were going to the same spot to get there. But what did that do? Eventually I learned how to get there, but I, eventually I had to find out these roads myself and to apply them and to find them myself. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you ain't gonna have all these trucks to follow. You're gonna have just yourself in a truck and that's it. Yeah. So you're gonna have to you're gonna have to learn to how to find the right road and to put it on your GPS or on the map and find it. And and I it was that I was afraid of doing that. It was something that was you know terrifying to me. But I ended up doing it and I don't learn how to do it. If you if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, exactly. Uh, and the Lord said, Whereon then shall I liken the men of this generation? And what are they like? They are like children, like unto children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you, and ye have not wept. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say he hath the devil. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of all her children. So I'm not sure exactly how you want to apply this, what you're thinking, but uh, I'm giving us. Uh, the, main verse, the main verse that came into my mind was the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. And I said, well, oh, that's uh, the people who used to being spoon fed, I guess. You yeah. Know, and so. Yeah. The Lord had to remove Jeff to force force us to study for ourselves. And I was thinking, well, people didn't want to go along with him because they didn't have the experience, the baptism that he had had. So they couldn't fully enter into. Plus, of course, there are sins and besetments they didn't want to give up or we didn't want to give up. And so I can see the way people flip flop. You know, they have this certain idol that they have and they have this clique or this cult that's built around that and then he or she fails them and then they move on to something else and they keep repeating this process instead of dealing with themselves and their own way to to yield yield to christ to have 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 that commitment to him that that is that becomes so strong that it doesn't matter who falls around you or your you know your 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 uh, pastor or bishop or whoever is taken away, you still can go on with Christ because you have that firm basis in Him. 
I mean, I've been in cults, so I know what this is all about, you know, and, and I, and I know like when, when Jeff, Jeff was taken, I thought, I'm just barely getting to know this message and now he's gone. I thought, well, what did I do for all those years I was in the church? Because I wasn't being fed most of the time, I had to study and, you know, and on, on, on my own, read on, on my own, lead, try to lead folks to Christ on my own. You know, like trying to find some teamwork in the church was basically impossible most of the time. Right. So so we need to know the truth for ourselves. People are, I mean, the problem with ancient Israel, I mean, especially in the period of the judges, but probably all the time, is that it is following the gods of this world. It, it, it doesn't want to take up that individual responsibility in following God. And, and we're the same in this movement. We need to understand the truth for ourselves. We need to know where we stand on things and, and not just go along with the crowd or with our friends. So, so it's, it's, it's a difficult problem. But here we see that there's Abimelech. So Abimelech occurs in the time of Jotham, right? So they... We say Joseph, Jotham is the 70th week, but then we need to understand what that spirit is that is being answered against. Right? Agreed. Okay. So we need to know why God has given us this message, what it is he's trying to correct. So whether we can get all the way marks laid out, you know, we need to know what this darkness is that we are struggling against. So anyway, our time is up. Um, so we'll approach this again tomorrow morning. Let's see where we go. Okay, thank, thank you, Theodore. You. Dear Father in heaven, we ask for your spirit to be with us throughout this day. Guide and direct us. And um, we pray for this movement and for one another. And we pray for ourselves, Lord, that we can be faithful in the little things that you give us to do. Um, help us to reflect your character. To love as you love. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.